Hey, folks. Welcome to another edition of the Small Business Show. How are you, Dave? I'm good, Shannon. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm yeah. excited for today because I've wanted to have this guest on for quite a while. Same. And yeah, we're going to talk. She has a really interesting talent stack because we're going to talk about digital marketing, social channels, which, you know, some really great uh, macro stuff, but also drilling down into how to be effective in today, something you could do today that wouldn't cost you hardly any money at all and uh, could have a big impact on your business. And she also has some e uh, e-commerce experience on marketplaces with different clients. And I love that because I'm a marketplace guy. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk with uh, Tracy Reuter from Divine Social. Yeah. Listen for the moment where she explains her action. And then there is there is but one awkward <laughs> pause in the show. You have three people in this interview that all are very used to talking. I don't want to say we're all very good at it. Tracy's very good at it. Shannon's very good at it. We're all very <laughs> used to it. Uh, right. And and you will hear a moment where there is no uh, there is dead air. And, and Tracy's not quite sure what to do. And it's because she sort of dumbfounded Shannon and yeah. I here. Or gobsmacked. Gobsmacked <laughs> like, uh. is, is the right. Yeah. It, because what she told us to do is something she's right. That was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It so it's, it's, it's one of the best actions. You know, we talk about small businessing here as a verb. And boy, howdy is the action that she has has teed up for us a good one. So I, I, I will leave it at that. She does a much better job of explaining it than I do. So I'll let her uh, ha have her glory in that moment. So, yeah, yeah it's going to be great. Make sure you stick around to the end to get that tip and a yeah. few of the little treats down there that uh, she's done for, uh, for our listeners today. Yeah, absolutely. And if, you know, it, to your point, Shannon, if you haven't been listening to the end and you've been missing those little actions, well, listen to this one and then decide to go back and listen maybe to some of the others, because I think you might've missed out. Uh, you don't want to miss this one. So, yep. uh, all right. Well, uh, you have anything else or are we ready to go here? No, man. I'm ready to small business. Let's do it. I am ready to small business. He is Shannon Jean. I'm Dave Hamilton. And this is episode 303 of the Small Business Show. Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's probably the latter. I think it's the fact that there's the, the biggest misconception is that, you know, you can slap up a conversion ad and that's going to be the answer to, to everything that you have, that it's that that's really all it is. And I, I think I think overlooking the rest of it, really, you know, ignoring the customer journey and uh, ignoring that people are at different stages, you know, they're at different stages of awareness. And, and quite often we see, you know, we see people who, uh, run ads and, you know, they're, they're talking to people at one stage and one stage only, and it's, it falls flat. You know, if, if I've never heard of you and you're talking to me in a, in a, you know, your copy in an ad is talking to me as if I already know you, that I'm ready to make a buying decision. I'm like, what is this? And who are you? And next, you know, like I'm not even going to pay attention. So I think ignoring that those critical stages and, and I think the other I guess if I could add to that, I mean, there's a lot to it, but being unwilling, being unwilling to put your advertising dollars behind the other stages, because so often I see people who only want to put their money into conversion campaigns and they're missing out by not, by not having a portion of their budget on the first two pillars. Dave, you know, I, I always talk about there's so much to figure out with digital marketing on social channels like Facebook and Instagram, right? It, it's, it can be overwhelming. Uh, it is overwhelming. Yeah. It not can be. Yeah. It is. I'm, yeah, I'm, it everything is. changes. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you have to continually uh, measure what you're doing, update your techniques because things that like work for me a few months ago, sometimes they just stop working. Uh, and and yeah. then, I'm, you know, we talk a lot too about finding trusted sources. It can be a challenge. So I'm really happy uh, to, joining us today on the Small Business Show is the founder and CEO of Divine Social. Uh, Tracy Reuter has decades of sales and marketing experience, and now she focuses her expertise on helping companies create and focus their strategies for digital marketing success. Tracy, thanks so much for coming on the show today. We're excited to talk with you. Happy to be here with you, gentlemen. That's cool. Now, we love talking about small business. So before we jump in talking about other businesses, let's talk about yours. Um, 
I, I, you know, looking at your background a bit, you've been in marketing a long time. How, how did you, you know, make that transition to starting your own business and uh, what led you to start Divine Social? Uh, well, it was definitely not, uh, it wasn't a natural one. I wish I could tell you it was a, it was a natural decision for me to go this route or that I was one of those, um, lifelong entrepreneurs from the age of two. That was not the case, um, (laughs) at all. Um, I, you know, grew up in a small town in new England, was told to get a good job with good benefits. And I did just that. So I took my route. I got a marketing degree, went into sales, worked my way up the corporate ladder at AT AT&T and thought I was going to, you know, was living the American dream at that point. But then my husband, (laughs) my husband got very, very sick um, at the age of 34. Um, He was diagnosed with Parkinson's on my 29th birthday. And um, that, yeah, that was not fun. That was not fun information to get, you know? Um, But I, so I was in this weird situation where it was like, I've got to do something. I can't be working 80 hours a week away from home. Um, Even though I was raised in this blue collar home, I did have an uncle that was a um, serial entrepreneur that I was exposed to and really inadvertently mentored by. And so I kept thinking about him, like, what do we do? Like, what can I do? Can I do something like that? And um, the long and short of it is I I ended up um, leaving my career so that I could uh, put my husband first. And it took me several years to get my my business off the ground. As a matter of fact, I had multiple failed businesses before getting into my groove here with the Divine Social and with this agency, but it was really out of necessity uh, more than anything. And you know, I think today I stay in it out of the freedom and the and the wonderful things and and how I really believe small businesses can change the world. But that um, that was not the impetus. I won't I won't kid you that that was the reason that I had some grand design to go and change the world. I just needed to survive back then. But wow! So so many people start businesses for reasons other than necessity. Yeah. Usually necessity is the thing that sends an entrepreneur back to the safe route, quote unquote <laughs> safe route, uh, of working for someone else. Whereas for you, it was, it was it, it same exact, you know, thought process, but, but different 180 degrees result. And that, I think it, it makes sense to me. Anytime I'm in panic mode, I'm always thinking, all right, what's the next business? What's the next opportunity? Not who can employ right. me? But not everybody thinks Well, I mean, way. I won't kid so, you. And during yeah. in some of the hard times, I definitely thought, like, am I nuts? Like, I had this ridiculously high six-figure job. I was a you know executive at a Fortune 10 company. Um, but, you know, the stress of that job with the stress of my home life was killing me. And then the stress of starting a business eventually almost killed me, but it didn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, <laughs> right. I guess maybe I'm, yeah. I'm, I was stubborn enough or I just, I really believed at some point that that was the only way I was going to figure out how to, how to have a future because I, I just, right. you know, that yeah. I was really, you know, I was only 29 when that happened. And I mean, that was, you know, just last week. Um, not really. I'm kidding. Course, it's been like, it's been like 20 years, but I mean, I was, a, I was young and I just didn't see how I was going to, I didn't see how I was going to make a good future for myself and balance what was going yeah. on in my home life. So it seemed like the only option to be perfectly honest. But kudos to you. Yeah, for, I, for I, I don't think that. you can put too fun a point on it. How, you know, a uh, crushing, you know, piece of information health related like that that could just stop a lot of people in their tracks and then you used it as a foundation to create uh, what we call the charmed life of a small business owner and having that flexibility we don't think there's much freedom as small business owners but there's a lot of flexibility <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and, and so you know like we think we we traded our yeah. freedom for flexibility a long time yeah, ago but, but that's but okay. being able you to know, connect yeah. with your family and spend more time and take care of your loved ones uh, I mean you know my kids grew up at my business you know one of them or another and uh, run around all day when they're little kids and working for us and that kind of thing so that that's just a a really powerful message of the possibilities of going out on your own. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And I guess maybe I think of the fact that I have like just the flexibility in itself is freedom. You know, when you don't have flexibility, I was on an airplane constantly traveling around the country, um, you know, in big client meetings, I had zero flexibility. I had zero freedom. And so to me, like it, it became that flexibility in and of itself was, oh my gosh, it was like breathing for the first time. So I get what you're saying. We don't always yeah. have the the freedom. I, you know, that the idea of the four hour work week to me is, you know, just a load of <laughs> What a garbage. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't figured that out. It's a out good yet book. Either. It's a great he sold book, a lot of books. Great book, but yeah. you yeah. know. That's right. Well, yeah, I think it's awesome. So looking at your website, 
you know, in my life, nothing is predictable, right? It's like I either, uh, every day I always joke out, I, every day I start at zero and I have to create it. And then at the end of the day, you look back and then you build on that. But one of the things that, that really struck me on your website is you you mentioned and you used the term predictable. You mentioned that you help small business owners create predictable results. And it just really hit me. I was like, God, I would love that. Why, why is that? And how do you, why is it so important? For small business owners, and how do you bring that predictable, uh, those predictable results to them? Yeah, well, I mean, it's important for a variety of reasons, but I think especially when it comes to social social advertising, which is our specialty, right? That's that's really right. our our wheelhouse. And it's funny because I almost feel like even even answering this question, uh, you know, the majority of our the majority of the work we do is on Facebook, and there's nothing predictable about Facebook these days. Yeah. So it feels a little bit <laughs> a, a little bit like a. Uh, an oxymoron there, but you know, I I think what's really important for small businesses to have predictability is you you can't have this whole feast and famine with your business where you know you're and it's it's just normal right where we're so busy working in our business we're not working on our business and um, and a lot of times we think that. Um, traffic is like the the holy grail. And so we'll turn it on and turn it off and turn it on and turn it off. And we focus, a lot of times small businesses only focus on getting the sale and they don't have this machine behind them that is constantly bringing new people into their ecosystem. And so that's actually a really big tenet of what, what we do as a, as a team. That's one of our, I guess, zones of geniuses is really, really helping our our clients understand how to create messaging and how to put things you know out there by using paid amplification, using paid social ads to always be bringing people into their ecosystem. And some of that comes from my background in sales, right? So yeah, I've got a degree in marketing, but then my career before starting the agency was in sales. And so I bring this kind of I don't know sales and marketing. They say they're they say that they they don't get along, but to me they they go together like you know peanut butter and jelly. And so, you know, if you think about the sales process and the customer journey, you know, if you come into my ecosystem today, you know, you're listening, you're, you know, listening to this right now and you're like, oh, wow, I like her. She's, you know, she seems to know what she's talking about. You're not necessarily ready to buy yet. Um, and, you know, we, we want to make sure that as we're bringing people in, that we have a process to keep them engaged with us until they are ready to buy. And there's a way to use social advertising um, to nurture and to engage people until they are ready, that zero moment of truth to make that buying decision. Um, and, and that's what makes it predictable by having essentially what we like to do is call them advertising funnels, these funnels of moving people through the customer journey so that you always have new people coming into the ecosystem and at different stages in the customer journey so that on the other end of that, they're coming out as, you know, uh, buying clients, paying customers. It's what we all want. That's great. And is this the evergreen advertising funnel that that you, you talk about up on your web, website at Divine Social? Is that is that right? Yeah, that's a that's exactly what it is. Um, you've done a great job checking out my website. You know what a great what a great interviewer. What a good host. <laughs> got to got to research. Right? Got to research. <laughs> yeah, I think you know that's that's really important. It, it, I, I think to be able to to truly leverage the different social platforms, to leverage the algorithms, to leverage all those things, is to have something in place that you can. Um, you know, unfortunately, you can't set it and forget it. That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, but that you at least have something always working. Um, we we essentially call it the three pillars to successful social ads. It's it's building audiences, it's creating engagement, and it's leading to conversions. And if you focus your energy on those three things, that's where that you know it, there's more to it for the evergreen ad funnel. Um, but that's how you create p- predictability. And all too often, people go straight for the conversion and they ignore the other two pillars. They they aren't focused on growing their audiences. They aren't focused on creating engagement. Um, but it has to be meaningful engagement and meaningful audiences. It's not really to waste, um, you know, to waste money. You know, we really believe we got to be a good steward of our clients' money. We want we encourage our clients to be good stewards of their own money. <clears throat> and their own resources. But, you know, having that in place that is not dependent upon a promotion or is not dependent upon the time of year is really, really important for the long-term stability of a, of a business, of any type of small business. Yeah. That, uh, it, it's so important. And you're talking to someone that is always going after the conversion. <laughs> I've spent, you know, I can tell you how many times, well, you know, what, how do we get them to buy something? But the, what you mentioned earlier, bringing them uh, the potential customer into their ecosystem to become this, you know, long-term, uh, you know, follower and then leading them in. Is there a uh, kind of a rule of thumb how many times or how often you engage with that customer 
before they make that conversion. See, I'm going right towards that again. That's <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I mean, hey, let's face it, Shannon. The the goal is conversions, right? We're not doing this yeah. because you know we're in, we're not a non for profit. I hope if you're listening right, to the show, right. right? You know, you're a small business owner. You're trying to you're trying to make a living. You're trying to be profitable. So. You know, back in the day, um, you know, before I had gray hair, um, it, it was, it was, you know, they said that before even digital, that it was about seven touches before somebody, you know, on average, you'd have to have seven touches with a prospect before they would buy. Um, and a lot of this is going to depend, obviously, on what you're selling. Um, you know, if you've got a low ticket item that people can make impulse buys, then that, that's out the window. If you have a more complex sale, that's a high ticket, you know, high expensive, high ticket item. Well, then that's going to maybe be longer, right? I know when I was selling, you know, complex systems at AT and T, we had a pretty damn long sales cycle. <laughs> you know, it was a long time, right? Yeah. So yeah, the funnel, the funnel is big and long. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yep. And so you know, there's some statistics now, and I don't know how accurate these are, um, but you know, everybody, there's a statistic for everything. But on average, the average adult is seeing 400 marketing messages a day. So to think yeah. seven touches is enough is is probably not true. Is it 400? Not necessarily. And so a lot of that comes with trial, trial and error. But it's essentially, you know, if you think of it this way, I always. I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And um, I love the concept of begin with the end in mind. So if you begin with the end in mind, which is the conversion, right? Somebody buying from you. And you start to ask yourself, well, what information do they need to buy? And what would they need to know before that? And what would they need to know before that? And what would they need to know before that? And how do you move them through that process? And that almost helps you reverse engineer the different types of engagement points that you need in order to move someone to a conversion. Now, if you've got, you know, again, complex sales, you can have multi-steps and there could be multiple ads and this whole super over-engineered complex thing. Or it could just be that maybe you need one or two touches with some really key pieces of content to get someone to pull the trigger or move to the next step. But it's, it's you know, I mean, think about it. The average, you know, married couple uh, didn't get married the first day they met. <laughs> Right, they, um, and for, for most, most right, there yeah, are, right. there's always going to be the one, yeah. right? But, but for the <laughs> most part, they they don't, and it it takes it's it's like that with our business, right? We expect, you know, we expect to throw up an ad and that, that people are going to buy. And if people aren't buying right away, we think the ad's not working. But the truth is, is we haven't done our part to get the people to, you know, toe dip towards us, like to put, you know, to put the toe in the pool and then maybe get into their ankles and start to move towards, oh, this isn't so bad. Um, now, granted, some people are going to jump right in, but if we only cater our advertising to the people who are going to jump right in, we're missing a slew of amazing potential customers. Yeah. So we, we are huge fans here of starting with the end. It, you know, we, we always talk about, you get to tell your own story. You get to write your own story. Well, it's way easier to write that story if you know what the end looks like. And th that same philosophy applies exactly to what you're talking about here, as you just said. And people do, they have what, 400 advertising sponsorship messages a day. We're about to do our part and deliver two of those to you. And our first sponsor today is a new sponsor for us, and it is Headspace at headspace.com slash SBS. That's where you're going to go to get a free one-month trial of this fantastic meditation mindfulness service. It, it, you'll use it as an app, but you, you want to go to headspace.com slash SBS on the web first just to make sure you sign up and you get that, that free trial. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. If you're overwhelmed, well, Headspace has a three minute SOS meditation for you. They've got all different lengths. So it really does work. You need help falling asleep, need help if you're a parent or, you know, all that kind of stuff. They've really tailored these things. And Headspace's approach to mindfulness can really reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. And it's backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, like 600,000 five-star reviews and over 60 million downloads. You know, it's, it's interesting. The story behind this is a great little business story. One person, Andy Puttacombe, was studying sports science, and he cut that short in full Steve Jobs fashion, and he traveled to Nepal, India, Burma, Thailand, Australia, and Russia to become a Buddhist monk. And then after completing that, you know, monastic commitment, he returned to the UK 
with this goal of teaching meditation and mindfulness to as many people as possible. And that meant politicians, athletes, right? Sports science again, and business leaders. Well, that's where Andy met Rich Pearson, who needed help with dealing with the stress of the advertising world. Aha! This is how these two came together. This is why we all know about Headspace now and why you're able to start using it. I've been a, a Headspace, I was going to say a fan, which is true, but I've also been a Headspace user for a number of years. This app really, really works, and I know you're going to love it. You deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. So again, go to headspace.com slash SBS. That's headspace.com slash SBS for a free one month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. And this truly is the best deal offered right now. Headspace.com slash SBS. Go check it out. Our thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Linode. While you're busy enjoying your meditation, Linode is busy making sure your server is up and running and doing what they do. That's how it works. This is the way things should work. And even better, you go to linode.com slash SBS and you get a $100 credit added to your account to start with. It's true. A hundred bucks. Now with Linode, it's cool because certainly if you're a geek and you just want, you know, kind of that bare server experience, they'll give it to you. I mean, it's, it's true. Like they'll happily give it to you. But what they also have is a bit of a marketplace there for you to be able to set up a server to do one of many different things without having to know how to get it set up to do one of those many different things. And so you've got marketplaces for items in the marketplace for WordPress. You've got them for several different kinds of VPNs. You've got them for Plex. You've got them for Minecraft, right? All kinds of different things. You just go through, answer a few questions, pick which of their data centers you want to be in. I think there's like 11 worldwide now. So that you've got, you can pick what you want. All their servers run on SSDs, which is great. The least expensive server they have is their Nanode server, which starts at just five bucks a month. So that $100 credit can go a long way, especially as you're getting things going and tweaking things. And then once you get people visiting, well, if it's, say, a WordPress site, maybe you, you need more than the Nanode. And so you can scale up and down and do whatever the heck you want. It's all good. It's all within the Linode cloud there. They really know what they're doing. And again, linode.com slash SBS is where you go to get that free hundred dollar credit. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, Shannon, back to you. Awesome. So yeah, I I do love that concept of working things backwards and you know, what what does the customer need to know to to purchase from us? what's is that the biggest misconception with small business owners when it comes to like social advertising? Are they just like me driving towards the conversion first and kind of forgetting that other part or is there something else yeah i'd say i'd say it's probably the latter i think it's the fact that there's the biggest misconception is that you know you can slap up a conversion ad and that's going to be the answer to to everything that you have that it's that that's really all it is and i i think i think overlooking the rest of it really you know ignoring the customer journey and uh, ignoring that people are at different stages, you know, they're at different stages of awareness. And, and quite often we see, you know, we see people who um, run ads and, you know, they're, they're talking to people at one stage and one stage only, and it's, it falls flat. You know, if, if I've never heard of you and you're talking to me in a, in a, you know, your copy in an ad is talking to me as if I already know you, that I'm ready to make a buying decision. I'm like, what is this? And who are you? And next, yeah. you know, like I'm not even going to pay attention. So I think ignoring that those critical stages and, and I think the other, I guess if I could add to that, I mean, there's a lot to it, but being unwilling, being unwilling to put your advertising dollars behind the other stages. Because so often I see people who only want to put their money into conversion campaigns. Totally. And yeah. they're missing out by not by not having a portion of their budget on the first two pillars. God, I'm gonna yeah. I am gonna take that and just play it back for every single person that we sell to here. <laughs> well, because so yeah. many people, you know, what we say is yes, great, direct response, cool you know, have your conversion part of it there, but the branding matters. And, and people that don't understand that will always, in our experience, will always see failure in their attempts when it's like, no, you're just not moving down the path the right way. 
So, yeah. Well, and it's not that they're necessarily going to fail per se, but they're never going to reach the level of success that they could if they really architected out something that was designed to uh, yeah. really draw people in into what they're doing. You know, yeah. I mean, they'll never cuz you know, a lot of times the you know, the conversion campaigns, they do work. It's not that they don't work, sure. but it's it's that it's that oh gosh, I ran those ads, they worked really well for a couple of weeks and then they, you know, got really expensive and we you know, we had to shut them off. Well, they got really expensive because you you weren't warming people up. You weren't moving people into the audiences. And I mean, I've got, um, you know, we've got example after example after example with with clients of ours where we've tested this and we've we've shown, we've even split it out in campaigns where we show them, this is how much your cost per acquisition was for traffic we never warmed up. And this is the cost per acquisition for traffic we did warm up. And, you know, it was 50% cheaper and then add on top, you know, add into that what we what we spent to warm them up and it was still 25% cheaper, you know, and it's like, you're, you're missing out by not having a bigger picture view of, of paid social. Yeah. And, and when you say warm them up, like warming the customers up, is it things like just finding ways to add value to those potential customers for, so they can uh, have a reason to have a relationship with you or something else? Yeah. So, I mean, there can be a variety of things. Um, you know, it's, it's educating them. It's, um, you know, answering, you know, I, I always taught my sales staff when I was back at at and we'd always really, we do a lot of training on how to overcome objections before they ever happened. Um, you know, anticipating those things. And so sometimes we coach our clients to create content that does just that, um, or gets into the mind of somebody who, you know, has a, has a problem, doesn't even know solutions exist, or they have a problem, they know solutions exist, but they've never heard of yours. Like, how do you educate them on those types of things? How do you inform them or get into their head and share something that they they can have this aha moment of like, oh gosh, I didn't, I didn't realize I needed that, you know? Um, so, so often, you know, people, people buy what they want, um, but it's up to us to, to give them not only what they want, but what they really need. And you can do that through different types of content. So it could be blog content, you know, you, you do a simple, um, campaign where you're driving traffic to a blog content. We, we highly, highly, um, use video. We can use video to do something like that. Um, you know, you can use long text, um, depending upon what platform you're on. Like there's so many different ways you can do it. And, and again, it goes back to what type of business you have, right? It, it's going to, it's yeah. going to vary if you're a small local business versus an e-commerce business versus a service business, they're all slightly different. And you mentioned video is, is video something that, Every business uh, should have as part of their, you know, the system that this ecosystem that you're building, uh, or is it just is it better suited to specific types of of companies? Well, I have yet to see um, a business where video doesn't work. You know, video oh. is it's it's work. I mean, it's it's the most consumed uh, medium that we see. Um, uh, when it comes to the pay, the, play, the paid social platforms, um, uh, ironically, eighty percent of all video is watched with the volume off. Um, yeah, so it that's is a Im- big, big, big deal. Big deal. So it's, it is really important, you know, that um, if you're going to use videos in your advertising, that you have captions, you know, because you have to understand people are probably not going to do that. I mean, it, it it doesn't have to be a talking head video. It could be a slideshow. It can be a demonstration. It could be, um, you know, you could actually take. Um, I mean, here's an example for you guys. You could take um, some some not even an infographic, but you could take still images with quotes um, and run video with clips, um, you mm. know, from the show, and you can push that into the newsfeed and amplify to promote what you're doing, um, and that can that's considered a video, even though it's not necessarily you know, moving pictures, you know, you could have sure. it be, you know, swapping out different quotes and things that were said. So uh, video, video works, um, unequivocally across every business I've ever worked with and every, every size, shape, you name it, because people really, um, we're just watching video more than we ever have. Um, you know, think if you yeah. think even about our own consumer behavior, how so many things are changing. I mean, we've got um, YouTube TV now because people aren't even the people aren't even looking at regular TV like they used to, right? People just yeah. watch video. So um, now that being said, just a little caveat, I, you know, if if you have the budget, you want to test different types of mediums because there are people who prefer to read over people who prefer to watch and people who prefer to listen. But overall, the biggest, what we see more than anything for performing the best, especially to get people engaged at what we would call top of funnel. So this, the beginning stages of the customer journey video is incredibly powerful. Yeah. That I think, like I think your experience in sales is is one of the one of sort of the secret weapons that you've got here because so many people that are doing this kind of marketing 
are just like you said, you know, people say sales and marketing don't mix and it's because they're just focusing on, oh, let's get the message out. Let's get the message out. You're saying let's get get the message out because we want to generate sales. So let's look at the sales side at the same time. And I think that that magic mix for you is is the secret weapon that makes you successful for you and, of course, for your clients. Well, I'd like to think so. I mean, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, it's interesting, you know, a lot of my peers, a lot, I've met a lot of great people that, you know, are in the social um, advertising game. And then there's a lot of people that, you know, they were like, Hey, you know, I want freedom. I'm going to start a business. I'm going to take a Facebook ads class and put up a shingle. Sure. Um, and you know, good for them. But you know, I, I, I bring, I definitely bring a different perspective that a lot of people don't have. I mean, not, not many people have the privilege to work for a fortune 10 company at the level that I did. So right. um, I would like to think that that is a big piece of it. And, and I, I know my staff um, will say that they've grown tremendously because I'm constantly teaching them sales psychology um, because that's not taught in marketing classes. No, it's not. It, that's the thing is I, I, I've never understood why these two things are separate. It's like, well, what's the point of the marketing? Is it to sell things? Cool. Well, then let's get some salespeople in here and talk about that, you know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm always like, you know, when you said like the branding piece is important, like people shouldn't overlook it, you know, that always makes me a little bit nervous because I've always thought branding is a waste of money. Mm. And I, I know that it's not, right? I, I know that branding isn't, but that, that, you know, we are designing the, um, building out audiences and building engagement campaigns. We're designing them to ultimately sell things, of course. not just to, not just well, to brand. I meant, yeah. but, but the branding side, when you said we need to warm people up, I heard that as we need to like that branding is what warms one of the things that warms people up. Then you come in. And so that, that was sort of where I was, I was bringing in the right. branding for that. Yeah. Well, and I knew, I knew that's what you meant, but I think my yeah. sales hat always is like, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it's, I, you know, I'm not a traditional brand branding agency, not even close. Right. Because, oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Cause no, well, we're definitely, you, you take it all the way through the funnel as you should. Right. I mean, like that's the right thing, but ignoring any part of the funnel, you know, if all you're doing is branding, I mean, that if your goal is to sell things and all you're doing is branding, you're probably not going to sell things. And if all you're doing is trying to convert people, you're also probably not going to sell things. So right. It, it, exactly. It, you got to warm them up first, then pull them through the rest of the funnel. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. That makes sense. Okay, so I have some other questions, not necessarily related to uh, uh, social advertising, but I, but I want to ask you one last one. One of the things that are always tough for me and my businesses is trying to figure out, you know, where does everybody's trying to stretch their budget, and you know, where do I go? Does it do I pump it all into Facebook, Instagram? Should I be LinkedIn? Should I be doing Twitter things? Uh, is that something that you help? you know, a part of your service that you help your customers figure out, let's, this is where we need to be because this is the best, act, you know, most activity we're seeing. How does that work? Yeah. So that's kind of like a, that's the holy grail, I guess. That's the, yeah. that's the million dollar question. So, you know, one of the things that, that it, it is a challenge, especially when your budget, when you, you know, you're on a shoestring budget or, you know, you just don't have the big budgets that some of these, you know, huge companies have. Um, so a lot of times it's like, okay, number one, what's your offer? Like what's, what's the pricing of your offer? Um, who's your ideal, you know, your ideal prospects? Like, who, who are they? Um, and from there, we kind of start to, to reverse engineer, like, where are they? Now, the reality is, is as of today, um, you know, in spite of where we are in the world in 2020, uh, the majority of the people are on Facebook and Instagram. They're, that's where they are. Um, and so the majority of our clients are going to be running campaigns on Facebook and Instagram. That, that tends to be the place where we're going to get the greatest bang for our buck using paid social. Um, and so that that tends to be if if I've got somebody that has a very very small budget, even if they're B two B, we s almost always push them towards Facebook and Instagram first. Um, mm. Now there there are some exceptions to that from time to time, but usually that's that's the right place. But then there are other things to take into consideration. Um, you know, again, who's the target audience? What's the demographic? Um, you know, we're starting to see. Um, we're starting to see some of the other social ad platforms or some of the other social platforms really step up their advertising game. So, um, you know, we started actually recently doing a whole lot on Pinterest, which is, you know, really, really good for specific industries. Um, we do a lot in the arts and craft space, um, in the DIY, um, home improvement space. Um, and that's amazing for those, those folks as well as some others. There's, you know, there's other categories as well. Sure. Um, but that's a, that's a totally different situation. That's an even longer play than we see on Facebook. It's, I, right. I, it's just a, it's, it's kind of a weird little platform, right? And then you've got 
um, up and coming with Snapchat and TikTok. So if you've got a younger demographic, then you know that's a great place to be running ads. And so some of it's going to depend on on all the things I mentioned. But then also the other thing that falls into into the decision making is. As a as the business owner, what types of creatives can you create to support the campaigns? If you can't if you can't get the um, you know you don't have the money, you don't have the resources to get the creatives you need for something like a TikTok or a Snapchat, you might you know you might need to just stick with Facebook and Instagram. But that is definitely something that that we um, number one we're always trying to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening on all the platforms because you know that's that's what we do. We're social that's ads your, agency. That's your job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sense. And then right. secondly, we. Just, we need to make sure that we're going to help our clients get the best bang for our buck. So a lot of times we start with Facebook and Instagram. And then once we really get some strong success and some good metrics, then we start um, dipping our, you know, dipping our clients toes in some of the other platforms and making sure that it is going to, it is going to reach their objectives because they don't always, you know? So. Yeah, sure. That's great. So, okay. W- we talk about mistakes on the show a lot. Um, I'm sure it's because I've made so many, but, uh, you know, we're here. And one of the things that we ask every guest is to talk about their best mistakes, something that really taught you a lesson that you may refer back to, uh, you know, from, from time to time. Uh, do you have something like that you can share with us? Probably more than I'd like to admit. Um, I, I'd say actually there's a recent mistake that um, I've really realized recently that it was a huge, huge blessing in disguise, but it was uh, miserable while it was happening. Um, we we um, had a, a client that wanted to hire us a couple of years ago. And it was just the weirdest, you know, as I, as the sales rep, right? It was the strangest situation trying to bring this client on. Really stressful, really... Um, just weird. I don't really know how else to say it. And, you know, then they'd go radio silent and then they'd come back and it'd be urgent. And we never closed the deal. And at the end of last year, they came to us and they were, you know, they really, really needed us for a huge launch. And, um, you know, honestly, I actually had a panic attack. Uh Um, I had a panic attack um, when I was putting together, you know, the numbers to bring this client on. And, um, and I, I just, I sh- I should have listened to my gut. Well, we didn't. Uh, Your dog Amazon- remembers yes, the panic attack. My dog yeah. remembers the Dude. panic attack. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah. she- <laughs> she's like, "Your biggest mistake is ordering from Amazon. They're probably at the door." <laughs> <laughs> Well, so we ended up not, you know, the client didn't, couldn't get their act together. Sure enough, they couldn't get their act together for the launch. And, you know, that came and went. And then, um, you know, the pandemic hit and they reengaged us again. And, um, you know, at the time we were just in this serve, serve, serve mode. We know we can really help businesses if we could help them do social ads right during the season, like we're going to make a huge impact. And so we took them on and we took them on also because it was going to be a very lucrative contract mm. and it ended up being, um, five months of absolute torture. Uh. Absolute torture. I almost lost my staff. Um, I almost lost my best, you know, my right hand. Um, and I knew, I've, and I've known for years, right? You don't follow the money. You don't take it just because of the Tr- money. Trust but, your gut on those things. Yeah. <laughs> well, my God, my gut was telling me with a panic attack, how much exactly. more, how yeah. much more real right. could it yeah. be? Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, that was, that was a huge mistake. I'm, I mean, I tried to be a very rational thinker, but I should have, I really, really should have listened um, to, to the, to that screaming uh, side that were going off in my body when I first died. Yeah, and those, those warning signs, right? Yeah. Where they would go silent and everything's an emergency, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and well, the good news is, is it was the only client um, that I've had to, I've had to fire. And it was, um, it was a big, it was a six figure contract and I let them go. And it was the, it was one of the proudest moments in my career where I felt so good. Um, and I think that the, you know, the, the emotional deposits that I put into my, um, you know, my team's bank account, like that I picked them over anything else was, was yeah. huge. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's good. Yeah. That's that'll, awesome. that'll, I, I predict that will pay dividends many times over down the road, but uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I, I wanted to have you on the show is because I always look at uh, the, the people's talent stack. What, what are they working on different things? And, and we get approached as you can imagine by all kinds of uh coaches and social media folks. But one of the things I liked about your background is you also have some experience with e-commerce selling on marketplaces like Amazon and things. And I love marketplace selling. It's been a really big part of my life uh, and my success. But I, I, I am well aware of some of the pitfalls of 
you know, relying too much on these types of sales. And and you had a comment there that I really like. Can you expand on the importance of balancing out selling direct versus relying solely on a marketplace for selling your products? Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, we've we've had the privilege to partner with a couple of clients that um, unfortunately had all their eggs in a marketplace basket and you know, one thing went wrong and they didn't have a business. And so, um, yeah. I, I just, I firmly believe that, um, it, it's, I, I think some of the channels are amazing. And if I were to tell you that, you know, we should ban, you know, we should never order from Amazon and I'd be a hypocrite because I, you know, <laughs> right. I'm not joking when that could have been it's Amazon. Too darn, too damn convenient. It yeah, is. Exactly. Your, your dog let the cat out of the bag. So I know. Bad. I know. She <laughs> just, she's busted later, but you know, I mean, it's amazing what they've done and what they, I mean, gosh, how they've, they've, you know, essentially brought anything you could possibly imagine to our fingertips. It's, it's amazing. But that being said, you know, whether it's Amazon or Etsy or eBay or any of the different platforms, you, you don't own the customer relationship. Um, right. And I, and I think that's the key. And, and, you know, I, we, we've got, gosh, one of our biggest clients has so many different channels that they sell through. They sell through, you know, major uh, big box retailers. They sell through um, Amazon. They, they sell through so many different places, you know, QVC, home shopping. And then they have a really, really um, big direct-to-consumer website. And it's been really fun working with them. Now, now we really only focus on the direct-to-consumer side of things, but, um, you know, the majority of of what we do for them is top of funnel. So we know that there's a halo effect and it affects all of their channels, but by them controlling, you know, by them controlling the relationship for a huge part of their business, there's so much more that we can do in terms of increasing, you know, lifetime customer value, um, increasing average order value. There's so much that we can control um, that I think it's incredibly important. If it were me, if I was an, you know, an e-commerce store owner, I would, I would make darn sure that I had my direct to consumer site really dialed in tightly uh, before I started leaning on some of these other places and not vice versa, because I, I don't know, I just, I've seen it happen so many times where you know, you, you've got this, in a sense, it's like a false sense of security yeah. um, with your business from a marketplace that isn't, you know, what if that goes away? And, and that's part of why we, we've we branched out from just Facebook and Instagram because I can't have my clients, um, all my clients add dollars in one platform that could bump its head one night and, you know, cancel all of our ad accounts, you know, so. Yeah, exactly. We, we so deal important. with this. With uh, with app developers, it's a great. There are app developers are a great example, especially you know on the Apple side where it, there there is you know there is the Apple Store and that's the only place to buy things, and that's where all the customers exist. And I always try to point out to people, you know, you don't have thousands of customers. Apple has thousands, nay millions of customers. You have one customer, and it's Apple. And exactly. until until you figure out how to engage with the person that bought your app from Apple, they are not your customer, right? You know, they are Apple's customer. And, and this exact same thing is true here. The good news is, of course, if you're selling, you know, not an app, you can you can sell that in Amazon and also sell it on your own. So you have that opportunity to do something separate from the one customer here, but it's, it's a, it's a really important lesson. And I just wanted to shine a light on it here because I think it's, it's something it's so easy to get lulled into that easy sense of, wow, there's people and they're buying my stuff. I have all these customers and it's great. It's like, it is great with Amazon, but be careful. There is a pitfall here. You don't know any of those people. And more importantly, they don't know you. Yes. So, yeah. Well, and I mean, it gets even deeper than that and we don't have to get too deep in it, but I mean, I've had, I had a client who had a seven figure business on Etsy and because of demand, she got too many negative reviews and Etsy without any warning shut her down completely. She lost seven yeah. figures of revenue. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's other pitfalls at Amazon, you know, we've started to see where you've got something that's hot and they're going to find a way to source it. And it, and not that they always do that, but I mean, you just have to, it can I mean, happen. It can yeah, happen. It's up yeah. to them. It's yeah. not up to you. And that's the key is, is, you know, if your business is all coming through or most of it, even if more than 50 percent of it is coming through one channel, uh, you know, you you have you work for somebody else now. So, yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I think a, a big part of what I've learned over the years on marketplaces is that policies never stay the same. Mm. So what, one thing that was working that you were doing, uh, uh, it could change in a heartbeat and the marketplace could say, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. or We're not going to allow that. Or this is the new way it's going to be handled. This is the new fee structure. And so you really have to be prepared for the inevitable change uh, that that's coming your way. It's true. For it's sure. very true. Yep. 
So uh, Tracy, w- one of the things we do this show to help other small business owners, and I love all the tips and everything you've, you've given us. And w- one of the things that we're doing is trying to get the term small business changed to a verb because we think action is such an important part of being successful. And so we, one of the things we started doing is asking our guests, is there, is there one action item that you can tell our small business owner listeners to go do today, something they could do today related to your uh, social advertising or even something else that would help them be more successful uh, right away? Well, I'd say if I could leave them with one action, because I love that. It should be, you know, small business is an action, right? Um, yep. If there is one action that you could take to leverage paid social a little bit better, um, if you're currently not, I, I would say, um, I'd say, look at, think about, you know, take a little bit of time and brainstorm. What kind of video could you produce that tells the story of how you solve people's problems? Um, how you, you know, fix their pains, how you, um, you know, how you make their lives better. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to go out and, and you know, get a video producer to do something like this. It could literally be a, um, you know, it could be a slideshow video where you have, you know, text overlay telling the story. But I'd be thinking about how could you create a video two minutes and under that could tell the story of what you do, um, at a, you know, at a high level with a, with a lot of value, you know, how, why it's going to make someone's life better. Um, and, and then I would really seriously, and if that's, if that's, if that's all you can do, have a, have a, a call to action at the end of the video for them to connect with you, however it makes sense for you. Um, and put some money behind it. See, see if you can, you know, put, you know, a couple hundred dollars behind that and, and run that or let it run for, you know, um, a month, let it, you know, let it run for, you know, a long enough time so that it gets in front of enough people and start to see how many new eyeballs you got on your business by putting a couple hundred dollars and maybe a couple of hours of your brain behind something and see what that does to start to balloon out, um, your taking people from, cold market, people who've never heard of you, to people who are now technically lukewarm because they've now engaged with you on some level and they could be um, great potential to be taken to the next level. So that would be the action I would take. Something as simple as that. One video um, you know, so there's, there's not, I, I know I think somebody that's brilliant. That, I, I think, no, yeah. thanks, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quiet because I'm processing like, she's, <laughs> damn, she's totally right. I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the best kind of reaction to have, by the way. So oh, this, good, it, good. Yeah, it's, you're totally right. Cause it, you're, it, you know, an afternoon and a couple of hundred bucks and you now at, at the, at the very worst, you have a lot more information when you're at the, when you're at the end of that and probably yeah. like you said some more warmed up c- potential customers but uh, and certainly do yourself a lot more information a lot more information i mean we didn't even talk about the, the like the value of just the information you gather by doing this kind of thing mm. but you know do do yourself a favor and and commit you know commit to whatever it is you know let's say let's say it's 100 bucks right uh, or it would even be 90 uh no, yeah, 100, 100 bucks, 150 dollars, right? Five five dollars a day, um, yep. 30, 30 days in a month. So let's just set aside one hundred fifty dollars and just let it run. Don't yeah. don't even don't even stress out about it because for that little amount, the the mistake people make. And I, I mean, I had a dear friend the other day, you know, beg me, please, 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 my wife's business. Can you take a look at the ad I ran? And it was like, oh, okay, you know, there were so many things that I, you know, I looked at it all, but ultimately, like, you didn't even let it run. You let it run for like three days and you shut it off. So I think if you if you could just set that aside and, and just keep it really simple and and just know that your goal is that you're going to get as much information as you can from that and you're gonna you're gonna introduce um you're you're gonna introduce your business to as many people as possible during that that window and see what happens see what yeah, well and and it, it like at the very least you get over your fear of failure with this thing you've never done before you may you may confirm your failure with it that's totally fine because you can <laughs> right well because confirmation of failure is way more empowering than the fear of it right because now you know oh i did this thing it really wasn't all that hard of course i was terrible at it and i failed but i i know what to fix now right and right. and there you go you're off to the races so yeah exactly yeah. exactly yep. and yeah, i, I guess one advice. other piece of advice if just because it fails doesn't mean it doesn't work mm. Ooh, I like that. Ooh, I'm, I'm taking that to the bank. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's great. So Tracy, thanks again for coming on the show, talking about divine social, uh, about social advertising, all this stuff, some really great tips. What's the best ways uh, for our listeners to connect with you and to learn more about divine social? 
Oh gosh. Well, first of all, if if you're listening and you are running ads, and um, here's here's what I'm going to do because Shannon and Dave are awesome, and we've had too much fun on this. Um, if, if you're running ads and and you are doing at least, let's say your budget's at least three thousand a month or more, and you really want to make sure that you're on the right track, email me directly. All right, I'll give you my personal email. This isn't my admin or anything like that. Um, it's Tracy T R A C I. So Tracy with an I at divinesocial.com, email me, and I'll set up a 15-minute call with you to just give you a quick rundown to make sure you're on the right track. So we'll do that first of all. Wow. That's awesome. Secondly, for everybody else, because I know most people aren't doing that, right? But for the rest of you, um, if you go to divinesocial.com forward slash SBS for the small business show, I've got um, I've got a, th- a, a mini class. It's, I, I alluded to our three pillars um, to successful social ads, and I have a, a video course. It's it's just it's not very long at all. It's probably 15, 20 minutes with some worksheets that walks you through the three pillars and really helps you create a plan so that you could you could start to execute this for yourself on a small level. I would highly recommend that you go there and grab that, download that course, and then on that page it has links to all my social, and you can connect with me all over the place. Wow. That's perfect. Thank you. For that's really great. That's, that's a, amazing. yeah, that's a great ad value. So uh, great to talk with you. Please keep in touch, uh, come back and update us from time to time. And thank you again. We appreciate it so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh man. I, I, I feel like I learned the most today, Shannon. This was excellent. That's usually me, but I, and I would argue that I probably did, but <laughs> you know, I, I love, uh, like one of the issues, the, the points you made earlier about her sales experience really changes the framework that she uses for her business uh, of social marketing. And that's a huge thing that I I, I don't think... Uh, As an entrepreneur, yeah. I, I, I mean, I always hired salespeople because, you know, A, I didn't really like it. I mean, I liked I liked when sales came in, don't get me wrong. But the sales process is is full of negativity, right? You know, I always say if you if you make 20 phone calls and you have 19 of them say no, you succeeded, right? So I would yeah. always hire salespeople and and I dismissed the value of the sales process until about 3 years ago when, you know, the my world sort of turned upside down and I I found myself in a sales role and I found myself in a sales role needing to sell right away. And so I did, and and we've turned the business around, and it's actually way healthier and way better than it ever has been. But it made me realize all of the things that she was saying. I mean, these were things that we were preaching to our customers about. You can't ignore, you know, what I call the branding side of it, the top of the funnel, the warming up of the customer. Like you have to do all of these things, and sure. and but without the, ex- the the sort of the hands-on experience of doing that again and again and again, it's easy as an entrepreneur to dismiss it. And like you said, just be focused on it. Just get the sales. Just get the sale. It's what are you, what are you wasting your time with? Just get the sale. It's like, no, yeah. no, no. They, yeah. Like to, in order to not waste your time, you can't just be focused on getting the sale. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's great. And yeah. I, I, just some really great tips. I, it's such a weird, sticky kind of malleable, uh, ecosystem out there on, on where to put your money and all the kind of stuff. And I, I really, think most small business owners, especially if like she was saying, you're going to spend, you know, a few thousand dollars a month, you ought to have somebody that really can monitor it, help you measure the success and adjust as needed. Yeah. I've thrown tens of thousands of dollars away at it thinking I could do it myself or have an employee do it. Right. And in my experience, it just doesn't work as well. It doesn't. Um, no. Bring, I, yeah. Bring in the specialists and I think you'll be more successful. Yeah. Yeah. But you, experts are good. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Absolutely. Or at the, at the very least, someone who is solely focused on it. But yeah, even better right. if that person is, is an expert the day you bring them on. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I, thank, thank, I, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I, I want to say it again because I think this line is one I'm going to use over and over again. And that's just because it fails doesn't, doesn't mean it didn't work. What a yeah. brilliant. That is good. Oh. It has to go up on the wall. It's going on. Yeah, yeah because it's so true. I mean, as soon as she said it, it was like, oh. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. perfect. It was one of those really magic great. phrases, man. Yep, it is. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Well, we hope you enjoyed the show. We'd love for you to leave us uh, a review at the podcast directory of your choice, wherever you're listening to this. I know it's a big ask. Every every podcast I listen to asks for it. I don't do it enough for them. Uh, we'd love some more of you to do it for us, and it really makes a big difference. You can also just go to businessshow.co slash reviews, and that'll redirect you over to the Apple uh, podcast 
directory to leave that review for us. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure to check out our sponsors, both headspace.com slash SBS and linode.com slash SBS. And keep doing everything that you can to live that charm, lead that charmed life for yourself. See you next time.